Hi, I'm your host, John Engel. This is Burroughs and Burbs, episode 84. If you're watching the video on YouTube for the first couple minutes, the audio and video are going to be a little bit out of sync, but that gets corrected. And with that, let's begin. For 84, I'm John Engel of Douglas Element in Connecticut, and that's... I'm Roberto Cabrera on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, and I work for John Harris Stevens. World headquarters for Burroughs and Burbs on West 78th Street. Thank you, Roberto. I want to thank our sponsor, nonprofit Grace Farms, right here in New Canaan. Folks at Grace Farms are passionate about making the world a better place. One of the ways they're doing that is they've launched Design for Freedom, an initiative to end forced labor in the materials that go into our homes, our offices, and public spaces. So we asked them, how can we help? And they said, first, go visit Grace Farms, have a cup of tea with Frank in the tea house. And then second, consider giving Grace Farms coffee or tea subscription as your next closing gift. Today, I have to admit, I'm a little nervous. New season, new time slot, new network. You can find us now on the Variety Channel at voiceamerica.com for the first time. And we've got Andrew in the control room looking down on us, making sure we don't screw up. And... Um, so let's begin. Our very special guest is Steve Schull, Super Bowl winning captain of the Miami Dolphins, a super realtor and a coach of super realtors. He's been a phenomenal success, and yet none of that matters. That's not why we asked him. Steve is here because he read Never Split the Difference, one of my favorite books recommended by Scott Hobbs, who you see up there. Scott Hobbs said, you have to read this. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, you really, you have to read this. And when I did, I was blown away. Groundbreaking book. Steve apparently had the same reaction to never split the difference uh, and, and the concept of tactical empathy. So uh, unlike the rest of us, he actually called up Chris Voss and said, let's work on the sequel. And they have just come out with the full fee agent, which is the sequel to Never Split the Difference. I have it right here. It's my new favorite book. It is groundbreaking. And with that, Steve, welcome. Why don't you give our listeners an overview of the new book? Uh, as you mentioned, well, first of all, thank you. My voice is a little rough today, so I apologize for that. <clears throat> like you, I someone, one of my clients gave me uh, the book never split the difference. They were at a book signing in Malibu and Chris was there. And one Saturday afternoon, seven odd years ago, I started reading the book and somewhere as I was reading, it dawned on me that I had gotten everything totally wrong as a real estate coach, uh, for 25 years. I was the guy trying to take emotion out of everything and boil it down to fact, logic, and reason. And in reading the book, I had the big aha that you cannot overcome emotion with fact, logic, and reason. And what drew me into the book was the title, Never Split the Difference. All of you know in real estate, that's what every agent does in every negotiation. Everyone just splits the difference. And so uh, I reached out to uh, Chris. I spoke to uh, his son, Brandon, first. We had a great conversation. Then we got Chris online. I said, Chris, everything that's in that book applies 100% to real estate. And we started working together. We started putting on some negotiation uh, seminars. And then ultimately led to writing the book together, which came out at the end of last year. It, it is a great book. Now, 
I want to just give a little bit of background. You were, when you say you threw out the playbook, when you began your real estate career, you did 53 sales in your first year. You were not an ordinary agent. You were a guy who put together a game plan, just like you would do for the Miami Dolphins, and you executed on that. And one of the things they told you to do in those days was knock on a lot of doors. The amount of business you do is directly dependent on how many doors you knock on and how many cold calls you make. Does that work? And when I got in the business, and this is 1991, so this is going way back. And Not the best time. No, the worst, the worst real estate market you could imagine. A multiple offer back then, that was buyers writing offers on multiple properties to see which one they get the best deal on. And if you got a listing sold in 90 days, that was a miracle. We were taking, you know, one-year listings, two-year listings. Uh, top agents were carrying anywhere between 100 and 300 listings. It was a completely different market. Anyway, I, I started out going to some real estate seminars, and I was given four options in terms of doing business. Cold call, door knock, expired listings for sale by owners. And I was not going to cold call for sale by owners. That didn't, that didn't appeal to me in any way either. And so by default, I started knocking on doors. I started with 25 doors a day and worked up to 200 doors a day. It would take about four hours to do that. And then I called every expired every day. So I was prospecting four to five hours a day and it started out slow. Nine months into it, I had 40 listings and zero escrows. And I'm thinking, am I doing something wrong here? And then uh, in another month, uh, the floodgates opened, had 10 sales and things kind of took off. Uh, as you mentioned, I closed 53 deals with a partner in year one. In year two, we were on track to do 100 transactions. And I came up with the idea of creating a coaching program for real estate agents uh, back then. And, you know, they had plenty of trainers speaking and doing workshops, but I was the actually the guy that came up with real estate coaching. And uh, I've been coaching 31 years now. I've done a lot of consulting uh, in 2007, opened up a, a brokerage out here in Southern California called Telus Properties that was ultimately bought by Douglas Elliman. So I've had a lot of different experiences in the business. So what's fascinating to me was that the playbook said you got to knock on a lot of doors. You got to connect with a lot of people. You got to fill the sales funnel. I think most of the people in this in this room, uh, doesn't matter what your industry is, uh, are are familiar with the sales funnel approach, and you have to fill that sales funnel. You've got to reach out to a lot of people, and then you basically calculate your batting average. Uh, am I successful half of the time? Do I have a good batting average? And what can I do to improve that with a better listing presentation? Two of the principles in the book are one thing was. Uh, don't worry about how much business you're doing, but how you're doing your business and the numbers will take care of themselves. So uh, that is a radical new approach to the business, not to focus on a massive sales funnel to feed a massive pipeline. Um, can you talk a little bit more about what it means to talk about how to do the business instead of how much business as a focus? Yeah, the coaching has evolved dramatically. You know, I I was into the numbers and goal setting and planning and all that stuff that everyone's been around their entire life. And then about three years ago, really got clear that the universe is going to do what the universe does. And the idea that we have any control, that we have any ability to manifest anything is complete and utter nonsense. And we'll get into that a little later. So I, I've, I've gone 
full circle. In the beginning, though, what, what made sense to me up front was the progression. Contacts equal leads, leads equal appointments, appointments equal listings, listings equal sales. Like I got that in the first two minutes and that's what I went and did. And that's why it was all about making 50 contacts a day. And if I made 50 contacts a day, ultimately that would equal 50 sales a year. And I preached that stuff for a really long period of time. However, having done this now for 31 years, I get to see what the end of the road looks like. And I don't care how much business you do. I don't care what the number is. It's never going to be enough, ever. I took, talked to an agent the other day uh, about coaching. And this agent, uh, a year or so ago, closed 320 deals by herself, not with a team, which is unheard of. And guess what? It's not enough. It's not enough. And so where my coaching has evolved to, it's not how much business you do that's important. It's how you do your business. Because if you can't do well and be well, what's the point? And I see too many, I coach lots of people who do over 100 million, 200 million, 500 million, 750 million, and it gets them one thing. They're all miserable, period. So it's not that more is bad. I'm not saying that at all. It's how you get to more. And where my coaching has evolved to now is six building blocks. One, the mindset of harmony. Two, time blocking. Three, CRM. Four, process management. Five, tactical empathy. And that's the work that I do with Chris Foss. Tactical empathy is the skill of making people feel understood. And then building block six is know your numbers. And if you work on those six things, I look at each of those as a guardrail to keep you on the path of moving forward in a constructive, positive way. So let me ask you, the, the, even throughout the, the, tra the, the transition you've had, have you evolved in how you're coaching? There's still the, the, the mechanism of discipline and some level of consistency at the very bottom as a foundation to, on which to build everything, even though, and that's from before and even now as you've, have you evolved, is that true or not? Yeah, I, one of the things I say, and I've said it for a long time and I still say it, is the thing you get paid most for in real estate is consistency, by far. And it's not creativity, it's not being smart, it's being consistent. I've just written a, a new book that'll be out later this year. And the title is real estate is not rocket science. Because <laughs> guess what? It's not. This is a very simple business. And what complicates it, what complicates it is fear. That's what complicates everything. And this is why what most agents are doing every day is they're chasing a deal. All they can see their whole time horizon is the next deal. And somehow everyone has it in their mind that if I can do one more deal, just think, how many times have you said that to yourself as a real estate agent? If I can just do one more deal, if I can just do one more deal, then everything will be okay. Newsflash. If you think one more deal is going to make you okay, you are never going to be okay. Well, it depends upon the size of the deal. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> no, a deal can give you temporary relief, no doubt about it. And a big deal can buy some relief. However, at some point, that feeling is going to fade. 
there, no one deal is going to, you know, last you your entire career. So at some point, the feeling is going to fade and you're going to be right back in to that scarcity mindset. And you're back, you know, chasing, convincing, closing. And this is why, you know, the tactical empathy, the book we wrote with Chris is just completely different. It's not about convincing. It's not about getting anybody to do business with you. It's about finding out, do they want to do business with you? And then secondly, do I want to do business with them? And sorry to break the news to everyone. All of you, anyone listening, anyone in real estate, all of you think, you think that you're winning and losing business based on your listing presentation and to a lesser degree, your commission. Not true, completely false, 80% or more of the time. When you get that phone call that you all covet, we're thinking about selling our home and we'd like you to come out and meet with us and you know, give us a presentation. Every agent wants that call. What you don't know is by the time you get that call, they've already made their mind up. They already know who they're working with or they're leaning strongly in a direction. And just think how many times have you gone out on a listing presentation and you were obviously the best choice. You gave a great presentation. They were very interested. And then you get that phone call. Gosh, we really appreciated everything that you shared with us. You did a masterful job. However, we've decided to go in a different direction. And then you're sitting there going, what did I do wrong? What, what, what's wrong with my presentation? And the answer is nothing. You never had a shot to begin with. So the coaching. I, I have a tough time just saying, yeah, I never had a shot to be. Uh, a lot of people in this room are like, no, no, I can learn from my experience. I can do better. I can be a better listener. I can be, you know, I can try Jedi mind tricks that we read about in the book, like mirroring. I can do a better job. I can win more business. Are you saying that's BS? 100%. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what you can get better at and which will serve you more is being able to determine whether what we call whether you're the favorite or the fool. My whole office walks around asking me, are you the favorite or the fool? Asking each other. That is all we talk about in our office right now. Pam Toner, who's in the chip right below you, she walks around <laughs> asking me every time I go out to a listing presentation, John, are you the fool? So um, hey, let, let, let me, and this is real. One of the things I deal in, I deal in real. I don't, I don't deal in hype. One of my clients, she's the client who on day one, she jumped in. And she's been leading the charge. And the other day, she went back through her numbers. She's been, we don't do listing appointments anymore. We don't go out to the house. We do a pre-listing Zoom call Thanks. to figure out whether we're the favorite or the fool. And that can be done in 15, no more than 30 minutes. Anyway, over the last four plus years, she's been on 500 plus pre-listing Zoom calls. She's taken 107 listings. This is in San Francisco. This is in a major market. She's taken 107 listings without going out to the house. 90% of those listings are at 6%, her keeping three and a half, when everyone in her marketplace is five or less. And the only reason they're not all at 6% because sometimes she co-lists property with another agent and they're not willing to ask for 6% and she doesn't fight that, that battle. So, and she is not the only one who has made this transformation and has benefited what, what tactical empathy does much more than money. It gets you back your time 
because you're not wasting it on business you were never going to get. She calculated out that she has saved 90 days, 90 days over the last four years, you know, 24 hours in a day, 90 days. That's how much time she has saved by not going on appointments that she was never going to get. I got I, I have a tough time with this. How do I square tactical empathy, being a good listener, being fully committed where you feel like you're the only person in the room and yet do, and, and saying, but I'm not going to come see you and I can do this over Zoom. I have to say it sends a signal to my prospect that I don't have time to learn about their house and I don't have time for their business. Once you understand the process, in many ways, you're making the point for me in this way. What's different, the thing that drew me in was the idea of making people feel understood. No one has ever taught you this in your business. They've taught you to ask questions, they've taught you to understand what's going on. However, no one has taught you how to make people feel understood. And what we don't realize, until someone feels understood, they can't hear anything that you're saying at all. They're just trying to make their points. Hold on. Hold on. on. Just what signals or signs are you looking for in the conversation to know if you're the fool or the favorite? Because you're not... You're not doing this strategy of, you know, should I go first? Should I go last? (laughs) Okay, I'll I'll walk you through it. So here's what a pre-listing Zoom call sounds like. Mm -hmm. You're going to get on that call and you're going to say, if you don't mind, if you don't mind, one of the things, part of this methodology, we always ask things, uh, what what are called no-oriented questions. All right, if you don't mind, you know, would it be impossible for you to share what's going on? Now we're going to get clue number one. Do they open up and tell us what's going on in the situation? Do they freely share? This is what we're thinking. This is why we're thinking this. This is what we're planning on doing. Or are they guarded? Mm -hmm. Or are they guarded? That's clue number one. Once they tell us what's going on, then we're going to make them feel understood. It sounds like, it seems like, it feels like, you're probably thinking, you're probably feeling. What we're targeting is a that's right response. Not you're right, that's right. And when someone feels understood, you'll you'll actually feel the energy. Two chemicals get released in the body when you make someone feel understood. First chemical, oxytocin. That chemical bonds people to you, and it also promotes truth-telling. There's an actual chemical release in the body. The second chemical is serotonin, which makes people feel satisfied and less demanding. That's how powerful making someone feel understood is. From there, we're going to go to what we call proof of life. And this comes from the hostage negotiation world. And proof of life is simply, I'm curious, of all the real estate agents, Why me? (laughs) And then you don't say another word. And you listen to the answer. The answer they're giving you is their perceived value of you. So if you get an answer, well, our, our neighbor highly recommended you. You did a great job over there. They raved. They said, we, we've got to, we've got to, you know, talk to you. We went on your website. We love, you know, everything we saw on the website. We looked up your online reviews and we love the review that Sally Smith 
when she called you this, that, or the other thing. What you're looking for is a robust response yeah, okay. versus, versus I'm, I'm curious, you know, why did you call me? Right. Well, we were driving around the neighborhood and we saw your sign or we got a postcard in the mail or we threw a dart at the dartboard and we came up on your name. So how they answer the question, why me, is a big indicator. Okay. Some other indicators. Do I fit the profile of what they're looking for? Remember, past behavior is the best indicator of future behavior. So what have they done in the past in terms of working with a real estate agent? Did they work with someone they know or did they work with a top agent? How have they made choices in the past? Do I fit the profile? One of the things, one of the clues, are they calling you or are they calling agents? There's a difference. Once you start listening, are they actually calling you or are they calling several different agents? Is the conversation collaborative? Is it back and forth? You've all been on you know, appointments where all they want to do is ask questions. All they want to do is gather information. That's a pretty good sign that you're the fool in the game. Can you make an emotional connection? Can you get the that's right responses? And then ultimately, ultimately on the pre-listing call, one, you're going to bring up commission right up front. You know, I'd like to get something out on the table that might be a potential sticking point. What's that? My fee. What's your fee? I'm a full service, full fee agent. I charge 6%. Now, depending on the market that you're in, most of the agents are able to say, I keep 3.5% and pay the agent representing the buyer 2.5%. If you have to go 3-3 three and three, based on your market, 3-3. Three and three. But right up front, you're telling them my commission might be a sticking point and they're going to go, well, that's higher than everyone else. And you're going to say most agents do charge less. Well, is there any flexibility in your fee? 6% is my standard. It's the fee I charge everyone. And depending on how bold you are, you can throw in, including my mother. <laughs> well, you know, I don't know. It, it, it's still high. Well, it sounds like my fee might be a deal breaker for you. And now we're going to get to the truth. And here's the big revelation. I guarantee, I know, no one has written more commission dialogues than me in 31 years. I it, 6% is, is my thing. And what Chris taught me, and this is mind boggling, when you're the favorite, they're going to pay you your fee, period. When you're the favorite, they're going to pay you your fee. They may push back once. They may push back twice. They're going to pay you your fee. When you're the fool in the game, doesn't make a difference what your fee is. Now, tw caveat, 20% of the time or less, I might be able to talk someone into doing business with me. You know, John, getting back to your thing, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get them. I'm going to blow them away with all my knowledge and all the things I do. The way we coach, we're walking away from that 20%. We're, we're, we're conceding. We're not going after that business. Because when you convince someone to work with you, now they have a very different level of expectation. Because you got them to change their mind. Now they expect a lot more. And so it creates a very different dynamic. And I've had to do what? I had to compromise my fee 
to get the business. So on some level, I'm a little resentful that I'm not getting my full fee. And so commission, getting a full fee, really comes down to whether you're the favorite or the fool. And this is the concept. You either buy into it or you don't. I'm not, you, you, all of you have to make up your mind. I bought in hook, line, and sinker. The clients I'm working with are having unbelievable success in terms of working with this. <laughs> they're no longer chasing after business. They're never going to get, and they're getting paid what they're worth. So, so let me ask you something before when your philosophy prior was essentially facts, logic, and reason, and you could convince somebody, right? There's right. still, it, there's still a component of that now, but what it, would you say is the balance of that? Cause it seems like there is facts, logic, and reason in presenting something yet the tactical empathy kind of becomes, it's like, that's the cake. And then the tactical empathy becomes the icing on the cake of how you, so I'm just wondering, how did you, how have you changed that balance in your approach? Like how much of it is tactical empathy? And I buy in, I buy into that, but I'm just curious. Uh, wait, all questions are game, man. This is, this is a quantum leap in terms of, you know, every single agent has been programmed and brainwashed in the same way. All of you. All of you you've been programmed that this is a beauty pageant. Your job is to go out and win the beauty pageant. And every force imaginable is trying to turn you into a commodity. It's happening all over the place. That's not your fault. You didn't create the system and nobody ever told you otherwise. So people have gotten really, really good at working the system the way it is. We're, we're, we're saying we don't play that game at all. So getting back to your question, one of the, the, the concept that Chris teaches that I love is when you're explaining, you're losing. When you're explaining, you're losing. So rather than explaining, tactical empathy is making people think in a very specific way, and that very specific way is making them think in terms of reality. All of you know, if I tell a seller to lower their price compared to them coming to me and saying, I think we need to lower the price, there's no comparison. So where tactical empathy comes into play, rather than convincing, rather than explaining, we're going to use what are called calibrated questions, how and what questions, and we're going to guide people to where they need to go. Now, remember, if someone is not willing to be helped, you cannot help them. If I insist that my $1 million home is $2 million, and I believe it 100%, I cannot help that client. I can only help the client who's willing to think about What's going on? We had a situation the other day. The mar is in San Francisco. The property had been on the market for 10 days. It was going into the third weekend. And the agent felt the property was high from the beginning. They had activity. However, no offers. And she felt that it would be in the seller's best interest to lower the price before the third weekend of open houses. She felt if we went past that, she was going to lose momentum. She also knew, she also knew that there's no way the seller wanted to lower the price because he had expressed it. He had all his rationale. And so she decided, all right, I'm just going to plant the seed. I'm not going for the price reduction. I just want to plant the seed of the price reduction. And she started having a conversation. I know you're not going to do this. I know you think it's way too early. I know this is out of the question. That's the no oriented stuff. 
remember, you, your whole career, you've been trained to get to yes. Your whole career, get to yes. When you're trying to get a yes out of somebody, it creates resistance. No, on the other hand, people love to say no. It makes people feel safe and protected. And if you want to try this out, an experiment that all of you can do for the next month, rather than saying, is now a good time to talk, all we say is now a bad time to talk. You'll see a dramatic change in response. Is now a bad time to talk? No, it's fine. So anyway, so she started off the conversation by saying what? There's no way you're even going to consider this. No way. That's how she started it off. And she let him talk and she let him talk and she let him talk. The conversation started on Tuesday. By Friday, she had a $200,000 price reduction and she had the property in escrow. All him coming to his own conclusion. She didn't do any convincing. She just made him think, made him think. And he started out, no, I'll never do that. Yeah, I know I should do that. We're going to wait. You know what? Let's just do it now. And she was just the facilitator. She wasn't telling them to do anything. And so, again, tactical empathy, rather than telling people what to do, rather than explaining. Ask yourself, do you love to explain to people what they should do? The answer is what? Yes. And why do you love to explain so much? Because you think it's your what? Think it's your job. Think that's where your value is. Well, remember, why do you want to explain? Why do you want to explain? Let me hear anybody. Because you're in control. Shows how smart you are. The reason, if you really get clear why you want to explain, is you want to feel understood. That's why. You want your clients to understand you. That's why you're explaining. That's why you're convincing. That's why you're telling. Well, guess what? They want to be understood. And it is about them. It is not about you. Not even a little bit. Not I mean, I, I feel like, hey, don't we have to get to know each other? Don't we have to form a bond? Don't they have to understand what kind of an agent I am? What kind of an, you know, how do I think the quality they, they of my thinking? It's all they've already, BS. They've already made their mind up again. By the time you got there, they've already. They've already either picked you or they're leaning strongly in a direction. And one of the, the, the big uh, truth serums that we use on that pre-listing call, and you want to get it in as early as you can without rushing it, is at the risk of not wanting to be presumptuous, would I be wrong to assume that we're going to be working together? And there's only two ways to answer that question. Yes, we're going to be working together and every other answer. And if you don't get a yes, then that means what? The fool. the fool in the game. You're the fool in the game. And now you got to exit, exit gracefully. I want to remember this. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Remember this. If you're the favorite, they have no reason, they have no reason to withhold that information from you. They have no reason to make you sweat. So whether you think you're the favorite or whether you think you're the fool, when you go at the risk of not wanting to be presumptuous, would I be wrong to assume that we're going to be working together? There you get right to the truth.
And again, all of you, yeah, but I didn't tell them what I do. I didn't show them my value. I didn't, we're not talking price. We're not talking home preparation. We're not talking marketing. We're not talking any of those things because it doesn't make a difference. They either want to work with you or they don't want to work with you. And if they want to work with you based on your price, then no, thank you. Can we I go get back? back. Can we just, sorry, can we just go back for a second to the conversation of when you said, I know you're never going to do this and you're essentially, a, you're planting the seed for a price reduction. You're never going to do this, but what's the rest of that exactly? You probably think it's way too early. You probably think it's premature. You're probably wanting to go through the weekend and see if we get any response. So again, we're just planting the seeds and letting them percolate. You know, you telling someone they need to lower the price goes nowhere. Them coming to you and saying, you know what? I think we need to lower the price. But so what about tax logic and reason in that sense? Listen, we've had 40 people through the door. You know, we've had no offers. Showings are slowing down. That's facts, logic, and reason. That's going to get someone there. What does that tell you? When, 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 when you hear that, you know, I'm, I'm talking to the, the seller. You know, when you look at that information, how do you interpret it? What comes up for you? So if we're giving them information, then what we want to know is how they perceive that information. Right. We're not, you know, we're not trying to con one of the things is taking this idea that I never want to convince anyone of anything. And when you make that your standard, that you never want to convince anyone of anything, it changes your game. It changes the game dramatically, dramatically. Because again, in this paradigm that we're coaching to, I'm not trying to get the business. Um, what I want to do is find out, do they want to work with me or not? And then do I want to work with them? So whether it's a yes or a no, it doesn't make any difference. It doesn't make any difference. And getting back to the earlier point, if I'm doing business in a certain way, then I'm okay. I'm okay. I know if I keep showing up, and I keep doing business in a certain way. I watched an interview with a young track star. His name was Noah Lyles, is Noah Lyles. And at the time, he was the world champion in the 200 meters track and field. And he was talking about a conversation he had with his coach. And his coach was explaining world records don't get broken when you're ready. World records get broken when the day is ready. And what he meant by that, I, the athlete, may be 100% prepared. However, if the temperature isn't right, if the wind isn't right, if the crowd isn't right, if the track condition isn't right, if the lane placement isn't right, all these things that I have no control over, if they don't line up in the right way, guess what? I'm not breaking a world record. Real estate is no different. Every single sale is a miracle. It's an absolute miracle. The fact that you can go through this process and people actually get to the, the finish line, it's a miracle. And so what we're coaching to <laughs> I need to be ready every day. I need to be ready when the client's ready, when the day is ready. I don't dictate. I don't dictate when a buyer buys. You know, I see all these trainings, how to get the buyer off the fence. That's complete and utter nonsense. No buyer is consulting with you about what you think. And okay, you think I should buy? All right, yeah, I'm, I'm going to buy. It doesn't work that way. You can't get buyers to buy. You can't get sellers to sell. They decide when they want to buy. They decide when they want to sell. Now, you can facilitate the decision-making process. 
you can't make anybody do anything. There's 8 billion people on planet Earth. Why in the world is the universe going to do what you want? Why in the world is the universe going to do what you want? Your entire life, you've been brainwashed with this nonsense. If you want something good to happen, you have to make it happen. Now I'm gonna. Now you guys are gonna throw me off the air here. <laughs> Napoleon Hill. Napoleon <laughs> Hill. Think and grow rich. What the mind can conceive and believe, it can achieve. What utter nonsense! Okay, that's magical thinking at its best. Oh, I'm gonna sit here and I just need to conceive and I need to believe and if I hold that thought and I keep at it then I can manifest whatever I want in this world. Really? <laughs> How's that working out for you? How's that working out for you? Look at your life. Look at your life, your entire life. You wanted things to happen. Your entire life. You've had goals. You've had wishes. You've had desires. You've had dreams. Your entire life, you're trying to make something happen. How often does it happen? And when it happens, guess what? It has nothing to do with you. There will be times when the universe lines up the way you want it to. It's not about you. Be very clear. Whatever is happening is the result of natural forces interacting for 13.8 billion years. All right, I want to get to two other, two other concepts you mentioned, fear right. and compromise. Right. Uh, you told the story. Uh, I've listened to all of your all of your interviews for the last two years, and there's a great nugget where uh, one of your clients called you up and said, I've got this 40 million or 70 million dollar uh, listing. We've right. got an offer. And now my client has said, I want you to reduce your commission. I want you to reduce it from five to take four percent. What do I do? What did right. you tell her? She was afraid of losing the deal. And she thought she had to do it to make the deal happen. Well, and we're all afraid all the time of letting the deal slip through our fingers and that we have to give a little to get, to make it happen. All right. So this is, this is, you know, I get a call at 11 o'clock at night, which I never do. And it's a long-term client of mine. We've been coaching for 20 plus years. And she goes, I need your help. I go, what's going on? She had double-ended a $70 million listing. Do the math. It's a pretty nice paycheck. Right? However, the client was coming back and saying, look, I think you should give a percent back. That's a lot of money. I think you should give a percent back. And the agent's freaking out. You know, they're asking for $700,000. Yeah, it's a big paycheck, but, you know, that's a big ask. And so I say to her, this is what you do. You get the seller on the phone. You say, look, I'm incredibly sorry. What are you sorry about? I owe you the biggest apology. What are you talking about? Obviously, I did a horrific job in getting your home sold. What do you mean? You did a fantastic job. Well, obviously, I didn't because... You're asking for a percentage point back. I can only assume that's punishment for the awful job that I did. Seller said, fine. End of story. That is a true story. Now, there's no way that agent would have ever done that in a million years. No way. She was sitting there in an absolute panic because in her mind, what was going to happen? She was convinced she's going to have to give up 700 grand. And what agent would, wouldn't give that up to make, you know, a million and a half. So anyway, that, that, that is a true story. So what happens in a situation, let's just say the seller says, look, with all due respect, 
you're going to make a lot of money. And yes, it's $70 million, but that's because I'm buying something that's $70 million. I could be buying something that's $30 million. It's not a, it's not, there's no difference. You're still getting paid a lot of money. And I think, and it's the same amount of work. And I love what the job you've done, but it's a lot of money. And I think that, you know, you should get, you know, I just think that you should conceive a percent just out of fairness. And it just makes sense. Yeah, because I didn't get what I wanted on my seventy million dollar listing. You know, I I've already compromised. Sure. I had it on for seventy five. So it sounds like you think I'm being incredibly greedy. A little bit. <laughs> Just saying. So it sounds like. You feel like you are overpaying me for the work that I did. No, what I'm saying is that if it was a $30 million listing, you'd make half the money and it would be the same amount of work. My fee is my fee. How do you want to proceed? I love how you always ask a how question, which in the first book, he says, you know, you have to make you, you have to let them leap over and try and solve your problem. Right. I loved that analogy where you say, how do we move forward? How do we proceed? You kind of lay it out there and, and then ask you always ask a how question. So. From a. A mindset point of view, none of this will work for you unless you're willing to walk away from anything and everything. And that's something, the root, in my opinion, the root of all evil in real estate is one simple thought. Something is better than nothing. I don't believe something is better than nothing. I think something is better than nothing causes you to compromise every value, every standard, every ounce of your integrity. I'm not a believer in something is better than nothing. I'd rather walk away if someone's not willing to pay me my fee. And I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. Again, it goes back to how I do business is more important than how much. Now, I'm not telling you, I'm, I'm not, first of all, I'm not telling you what to do with your money. It's your money. I'm not telling you what you should do with it. It's yours. I am sharing with you, if you want to get paid what you're worth, this is how you can do it. This is how you can do it. So it's your money. You decide what you want to do with it. What's your response on compromise in the middle of the deal? Roberto is at um, one million, and I've been asking uh, a million two, and he says to me, "Well, let's see if I can get my client up a hundred, and you can get your client down a hundred, and let's see if we can split the difference." Is splitting the difference always a bad idea? And what? How do you respond when you don't want to? When you're done? Well is wearing a brown shoe and a black shoe always a bad idea at the same time yes yeah would you i, I just had this situation this morning uh it's a six and a half million dollar deal and they're they're now a hundred and fifty thousand apart and the buyer is uber wealthy and the seller is uber wealthy so it's not about money and the agent was anticipating we're under a minute guys just say we're under a minute okay she was anticipating she's going to get a call from the other agent saying why don't we just each chip in a point and i said that's ridiculous they they don't need your sixty thousand dollars they don't need your money and here you you're you're the poorest person in the room and here you are offering up your money don't give your money away. Compromise is never equal. Anyway, I appreciate the opportunity. Steve, thank you so much for being here. It's really, I mean, we, we've never been so quiet and just listened 
<laughs> in an hour. That's incredible. We can continue the conversation. We're going to lose the live audience on Voice America. But I mean, if you'll stay uh, stick around for a few minutes, you know, I'd love to continue uh, to, talking with you. I still have more questions. All right. I can do that. I can do that. So thank you, Roberto, my 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 co-host in New York. Thank you, Steve Scholl. This was an amazing hour. We've never been so quiet. Thank you to my sponsor, Grace Farms, uh, for helping to uh, make the world a better place. And we'll see you all next week on Voice America Variety Channel, Thursdays at 3 o'clock Eastern. Thank you, everybody. All clear. Great job today, everyone. Fantastic show. <laughs> Okay, take thanks, care. Voice Have America. a great week. Take care. Thanks. Yeah, so I'm still on this, uh, I guess, this compromise uh, question. And because, as you pointed out, it happens every day of my life. Well, why don't we just meet in the middle? Why don't we just meet the middle? And and uh, even the notion of my 6% fee, well, we should split it equally. Um, you know, and why should somebody earn more than the other? I mean, it's it's deep within us to meet in the middle. Right. And again, the reason having done this for 31 years and seeing where everyone ends up, it's not in a good place. It's not in a good place. And the thing that should scare the heck out of every real estate agent is the idea that you're going to be in this business because this is a 30 plus year career. That's what real estate is. It's 30 plus years. And do I want to be in business for 30 plus years, busting my butt, doing a great job, have a great reputation, and I've got to give away my money in order to get a deal? Do I really want to be in that place at the end? No, I want to be at a place where I have standards. If you look at most agents, what they're doing, and again, you know, you can hate me for this. First of all, I don't believe you can call yourself a top agent if you're not charging a full fee. I don't believe that at all. If Tom Brady is behind by seven in a game, he can't go out and buy a touchdown. He's got to go out and do something. You know, the idea that I'm going to give my money away, I'm going to give my money away to put a deal together. There's no skill involved in that and more importantly i know how hard real estate agents work i you know i i've been one married to one had a company i've been around realtors for forever and you bust your butt nobody understands what you do no one appreciates what you do no you know they all think you're overpaid they all think you, they can do your job better than you. They're just not inclined or they you know, don't have the time. And so if you don't stand up for your paycheck, who will? Who will? And there's something that I call the adjustment standard. We adjust to the standards we set in life. 6% is a standard. And when you make 6% your standard, it simplifies everything. Because I don't have to stress over anything. That's my fee. They want to pay it or they don't. We were talking about buyer broker agreement last night. I'm big. I don't know why anyone would ever work with a buyer without a buyer representation agreement signed. I don't, I don't get that in any way, shape, or form. And it's real simple. If you want to work with me, I work with a buyer representation agreement. And my minimum fee in working with a buyer is two and a half percent. What does that mean? Well, this agreement spells out my fiduciary responsibility to you in helping you find, purchase, and close on a property. And in return, you're committing to me. That if, if you buy a home, you're going to buy through me. And it also states that I'm going to be paid a minimum of two and a half percent. And if for some reason the listing is not offering 
a full two and a half percent to the agent representing the buyer, you would be responsible for making up the difference. And if the buyer says, well, why would I do that? Why, you know, why would I do that? Very simple. If you want to work with me, you have to sign the agreement. If you don't want to work with me, then we're done. And, and that's it. But why am I going to chase around, you know, especially in a market like this where there's little inventory in most marketplaces, bust my butt. You've all had it happen to you. You've all had a buyer that you worked with for a period of time, walk into an open house or somewhere else, a party and buy away from you. Again, standards. If you're going to be in this business and you're going to thrive, you have to set standards. Going back to the initial discussion, it's more about it's having the discipline to stick to your standards. It's hard. It, it's, it's incredible. I got to go. I got a massive appointment. I got to go. I'm going to empathize the crap out of these people. And I appreciate it. All right. <laughs> Thanks. Bye. All right. One last question for me, sure. though. You sure. said um, that um, I, I'm just going to read it. What does it mean to have a transactional oriented business? And how do I make the change to a referral based relational business? Okay. How do I build trust? And what is the role of transac transactional empathy in relationship selling? And all that means is that in your book, you say, stop worrying about how much business you do and start thinking about how you do business and the numbers will take care of themselves. Most of your business will come through people who trust you and refer you to other we all know that in the real estate business, that most of our business comes from referrals and uh, people who who appreciate our value. So how do I, if I'm still afraid of just basically uh, getting away from a fill the funnel approach and move to a relational business, help me understand how to do that, how to fill up my relational funnel, build trust. So I would tell you, go back over the last five years, if you can, and figure out exactly how much of your business was a repeat and referral. And most every agent, at a minimum, it's going to be 50%, if not 60, 70, 80, 90, or more. That's where the business comes from. It's repeat and referral. However, most agents have a fascination of chasing after new people. And they do very little to cultivate the relationships and the people that they know. So my coaching is all around specifically building a repeat referral business based on the reality that's where the business comes from and i don't want to waste my effort and so a transactional orientation i'm focused on a deal a relational orientation i'm focused on cultivating relationship over time i understand crm it's not a dumping ground the only people that go in my crm are the people I'm committed to being in a relationship with. I define that at a minimum of a phone call every 90 days. Everybody in my CRM is set up on an action plan and I get my dashboard down to zero, meaning whatever my CRM tells me to do every day, I do it. So rather than chasing a deal every day, you know, instant gratification, bright, shiny objects, I'm working my CRM. And I have faith, and again, belief that if I do that, I'm going to come out ahead. The human predicament, the, the predicament that all of you are in. Every day you continue to do the things that you have always done that have never worked the way you want them to, and yet you're still hoping somehow it's going to work. It's the classic definition of insanity. I'm saying to everybody, stop with the insanity, get smart. You know, you hear work smarter, not harder all the time. The way to work smarter is understand it's a repeat referral business. And, you know, the subtitle of the book, how to stack your odds, uh, how to stack the odds in your favor as a real estate professional. The way you stack the odds in your favor is to focus on the people you know and the people you've done business with. They are high probability prospects rather than going after low probability prospects. 
you know, look at Zillow. Agents spend millions of dollars on Zillow. A Zillow lead is a 3% buyer lead, meaning I've got to stop what I'm doing, run out, show property to somebody I don't know, and three times out of 100, they might buy. That's why agents don't make any money because they're doing that nonsense every day. Because, oh, I might get a deal today. So the three big paradigm shifts, we move from transactional to relational, we move from value to trust, and we move from hope to truth. Truth is the most efficient, cost-effective way to run your business. Agents love to live in hope. Any agent would prefer a maybe over a hard no any day of the week. I'll take a hard no any day of the week over a maybe. And so those, uh, I put my 250 people who I, everybody for whom I would send a Christmas card, I put them in my CRM. I reach out to them. I talk to them. I make them feel heard every 90 days. And I ask them for referrals. No, it, it, all you need to do, how you doing? If they want to talk real estate, they'll bring it up with you. Just think for a second. I'm a homeowner. I have a choice. I can work with someone I know and trust to sell my home, or I can work with a complete stranger. The choice is pretty obvious. Most people are going to choose working with someone they know and trust. The problem all of you have, you got in your head somewhere that nobody wants to hear from you. And that's why you won't reach out to your client. I make people reach out to past clients from 10, 15, 20 years ago. Literally, they haven't spoken in that long. And you know what the reaction is almost every time? Oh my God, it's so great to hear from you. You know, that call and how you make that call, look, you probably don't know who this is. You're probably going to think I'm the worst real estate agent on planet Earth. And you probably want nothing to do with me. Oh, my God, look who it is. So great to hear from you. It happens nine out of ten times that way. I love that as an ending. You know, what? that makes me feel good. I'm going to call somebody I haven't talked to in five years just to make myself feel good when they say, I'm so glad to hear from you. Yeah, that's exactly what you're going to hear. That's exactly what you're going to hear. And then you'll have this 20 minute, 30 minute conversation. And you're going to go, I can't believe I was so afraid to talk to that person for all these years. It's crazy. And that is how I'm going to grow my business. The business will take care of itself if I'm talking to more people in an authentic right. way. Right. And I'm positioning myself as a trusted advisor. And again, we're not trying to get anyone to do anything. You know, helping people buy and sell. It's sacred. It's sacred. It's the American dream. You're in a service business. The, the thing to remember, be of service to the people who are going to do business with you. Too many agents spend too much time being of service to people that are never going to be in business. They're, they're never going to be in business with. Anyway. Thank, thank you, you so that. much. This has been the most profitable hour. And I mean, I think it's going to just uh, help my life. I'm going to probably lose a little bit of fear and let go and just allow myself to be the agent I want to be. Instead of an anxious agent who's trying to grow for growth's sake. So, I mean, you look at you. You've got a great personality. You've got great energy. You're obviously committed to what you do. Remember, fear is the thing that slows us down. Worry, doubt, they never, it, it never helps us in any way. Step one, let go of all your fear. Anyway, thank you all. Thank you, Steve. All right, bye -bye. Thank you all. And I'll see you all again next week. And you can all find the recording of this on both voiceamerica.com and on YouTube. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, everybody. Bye. -bye. Bye.